there are enough odd stories in my home state that aliens do not make an appearance in this. Nor is there anything that's gone on at the National Labs or anywhere else the white vans with flat windows go. I don't even have any meth heads in here. I went with five stories that have always just kind of stuck out in my head. If you guys like this video, I could do more. There's a lot of interesting New Mexico history that does not fit in this theme. We could cover things like Pope's Rebellion, the Battle of Glorieta, and the company mining towns. But enough yapping, let's get into it. to kick it off with the New Mexico story. See, there is a piece of New Mexico history that is drilled into everyone that lives here, and it is about how this staircase was made. These stairs live in the Loreto Chapel in Santa Fe. The story goes that during the construction of the chapel in the late 1870s and early 1880s, there was a problem. They did not have plans for the stairs to get to the choir loft. Some sources say it's because the architect and possible Warhammer 40k character, Projectus Moly, died suddenly during construction. The nuns there, known as the Sisters of Loreto, approached multiple tradesmen to try and build stairs to the loft, but no one could come up with a way to do it that wouldn't take up too much space in the small chapel. The story goes that the nuns prayed for nine days straight and a man appeared saying he could do it. And he did. Depending on the account, it either took him a night or more likely a few months. But either way, the stair master delivered on his stair plan. What he built is very impressive even by today's standards. He made a spiral staircase with no glue, no nails, and more interestingly, no central pole for support. He then left without taking payment. The nuns claimed that the man must have been Saint Joseph. In case you did not realize this either, Saint Joseph is the Joseph that was a carpenter who married Mary. So let's go a bit deeper into this. A common claim for the stairs is that they are not physically possible. They do make sense physically wise though because they are a helix instead of spiral which adds strength to the staircase. Also if you look it now has some little metal braces from it to the walls near it. These were added in 1887 when they also put handrails on it. The handrails were added because apparently the nuns were scared to use the stairs. Supposedly they are going up and down on their hands and knees because in addition to not having handrails it also tends to move like a spring when people are on it. Also not having glue or nails was not a strange thing at the time. The 1870s were still fairly early into the industrial revolution so nails were still kind of expensive especially since Santa Fe was kind of in the middle of nowhere at the time. There are theories about the identity of the carpenter, including it being a French rancher that lived nearby, but as with most mysteries from history, it is hard to know for sure. No face, no case. All that said, whoever built it was a world-class carpenter, and it's weird that they were in New Mexico in the 1880s when it wasn't even a state. The design and craftsmanship is amazing. The stringers, which are the parts on either side of where you step, are made of wood that was bent in two directions in order to achieve the helix. Also, the wood is a type of spruce that has not been identified apparently, although I am not sure how hard they have tried to identify it. All in all, regardless whether it was a gift from God, they are very pretty stairs. One of the more famous stories in New Mexico history is the Lincoln County War. It was a prolonged conflict between two store owners named James Dolan and John Tunstall. They organized armed groups to fight each other intermittently from 1878 to 1881. 23 people were killed, more were wounded. Tunstall's group included Billy the Kid, and the whole story has become pretty famous. The movie Young Guns is about the Lincoln County War, and there's a lot of other media that covers it. That is why we are not going over the whole story today. Instead, I am going to give you some strange information that is tangential to it. The territorial governor of New Mexico during the Lincoln County War was a man named Lou Wallace. Lou Wallace was in the Union Army during the Civil War and also oversaw the investigation into the Commandant of the Andersonville Prison, Henry Wirtz. This and some other political moves over his years led to Rutherford B. Hayes appointing Wallace as Territorial Governor of New Mexico in 1878. Also, fun fact, U.S. territories didn't elect their own governor till 1948. New Mexico didn't become a state till 1912. Wallace played a role in the Lincoln County War, including issuing arrest orders for those involved in 1879. He also possibly met with Billy the Kid, a.k.a. Henry McCarty, a.k.a. William Bonney, a.k.a. Emilio Sheen. Supposedly Billy the Kid was offered amnesty by Wallace in exchange for testifying against other people involved in the conflict. However, the prosecutor backed out of this deal, and there are a lot of theories as to what actually happened. So far, this might not seem that strange. But the part of the story that is strange is what Lou Wallace was doing in his spare time at the governor's palace during all this. He was writing the book. Ben Hur. That's right, the best selling American novel of the 19th century. In fact, it was the best selling book written by an American till Gone with the Wind overtook it in 1936. Here's a quick synopsis if you haven't read it or seen one of the five movie adaptations. A Jewish prince named Judah Ben Hur, living in the Holy Land at the same time as Jesus, is wrongly imprisoned and enslaved. Him and Jesus repeatedly interact over a big story of Judah Hur's revenge, chariot racing, and eventually redemption by becoming a Christian. There is something really ironic about writing one of the most famous redemption stories in history while possibly screwing over Billy the Kid trying to. To testify for immunity. Also, interestingly, Lou Wallace was not a particularly religious man by his own admissions. He said he believed in the Christian God, but he did not regularly attend church because, quote, freedom is enjoyable. Overall, an interesting man. Our next topic is about another interesting man, but his story has a much darker ending than Ben Hur. Next up, we're going to talk about Tom Ketchum. 
No relation. Tom Ketchup was born in 1863 in San Saba County in Central Texas. Tom and his brother Sam bounced around Western Texas committing crimes till sometime around 1890. They moved to New Mexico to work as cowboys but soon started engaging in a bit of casual train robbery. They robbed their first train in 1892. The train was heading towards Deming, New Mexico. Tom and a gang of men accosted that train near Nut, New Mexico and took its load. This was just the start of his criminal career. In the following years, he was linked to crimes ranging from robbery to murder. After building up his resume, he joined the Hole in the Wall Gang. This was a gang that operated over much of the West and even included famous members like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They were named the Hole in the Wall Game because they would hide out in the Hole in the Wall Pass in Wyoming. It was a very successful hideout with no one actually being captured by the law while in the Hole in the Wall. Other gangs would also use the hideout in this mixing of gangs led to Tom Ketchum being mistaken for a man known as Black Jack Christian. Tom apparently liked that because he became known as Black Jack Ketchum. This was the beginning of the end for Black Jack though. In northeastern New Mexico, there are two towns named Folsom and Des Moines that are about eight miles apart. The gang decided to stage a train robbery on that railroad that runs between the two towns. By the way, the footage on screen is the actual area, courtesy of Ratman Bob on the scene. The gang successfully robbed a train on this eight mile long stretch of track on September 3rd, 1897. It was apparently a good haul and no one got caught. The issue started though when they robbed a train on the same eight mile long stretch of track less than two years later. The gang staged a robbery there without blackjack on July 11th, 1899. After a series of run-ins with authorities due to this, Sam Ketchum was shot and eventually captured. He would die soon after of his wounds at the Santa Fe Territorial Prison. Then, a little over a month later, on August 16th, 1899, our boy Blackjack tried to rob a train by himself, and guess where it was? It was on the same eight mile long stretch of track! Supposedly, he did not know about the heist with his brother, or even that his brother had died. So Blackjack rode up to the train on his horse, and the conductor recognized him at this point. So the conductor pulled out a shotgun and started blasting. Blackjack was hit from the side, knocking him off his horse, and the train kept chugging along, leaving Blackjack there, but the authorities came to collect him the next day. He was taken to Mount San Rafael Hospital in Trinidad, Colorado, where his arm was amputated. Side note, I cannot imagine going over the Ratone Pass, which you have to to go from where he was shot to Trinidad, with a gaping injury on a horse. I would prefer they just shoot me again. Once he had healed enough, he was taken to Clayton, New Mexico to stand trial. He was convicted of felonious assault upon a railway train and sentenced to death. Blackjack was the only person ever executed for this charge as it was later found to be unconstitutional to execute someone for train robbery. He did probably kill people before all this, but they didn't convict him on any of those. He is also the only person to ever be executed in Clayton, New Mexico, and things got a little sloppy. Blackjack gave his last words in the gallows saying, Goodbye. Please dig my grave very deep. All right, hurry up. He then dropped through the trap door, and a fraction of a second later, his head popped off. In the one and a half years he was in jail, Blackjack had gained a lot of weight. There was a table to figure out how long a rope should be to snap someone's neck in a hanging, and they reportedly used his weight from when he was captured. There is also speculation that his missing arm may have affected the outcome by changing the center of balance. There are multiple pictures of this incident, including one I'm not showing. I want to be monetized. It clearly shows his head next to him on the ground and his open neck stump. That one was turned into a postcard and sold to commemorate the event. Execution souvenirs are actually a weirdly common thing throughout history, by the way. In Europe, executioners used to make extra money by selling the blood of the executed. Also, souvenirs and even programs like the ones you get at a play were often sold at public executions. As much as people decry violence in movies and video games, our ancestors weren't any better. No matter where or when you go, humans are always doing something messed up. Black Jack was buried in Clayton Cemetery, and he has a lovely grave. <laughs> Now, I'm going to give you some backstory on an American icon. Smokey Bear, no the, has been the U.S. Forest Service's fire prevention mascot since August 9th, 1944, which is his canonical birthday. Six years later, in 1950, there was a forest fire near Capitan, New Mexico. Firefighters found a young black bear who had climbed a tree to escape the fire. He had lived but was burned on his paws and legs. He was named Smokey after the recently created mascot. The little bear was taken in by a New Mexico game and fish ranger named Ray Bell. Ray and his family worked with a local vet to get Smokey healthy. While Smokey was healing, the national media caught wind of his story and he became a star. Once Smokey was healthy, he was flown to Washington, D.C. to live in the National Zoo. Smokey was not releasable due to living with humans for most of his life at this point. He had a lovely life in D.C. He even had a lovely wife named Goldie Bear who lived with him starting in 1962. The hope was that they would have a cub or two and carry on the Smokey Bear mantle, but that did not happen. The Forest Service still wanted an heir, so they found an orphaned cub from the Lincoln Forest in New Mexico and put it with Smokey and Goldie. The official story was that they adopted the cub. The cub was called Little Smokey. Smokey, and in 1975, he was anointed Smokey 2, Electric Boogaloo. This coincided with our original Smokey, quote, retiring. I can't find a disclosed reason why he retired, but I assume it was health. He died next year on November 9th, 1976. Smokey was flown back to Capitan, New Mexico to be buried. 
Today, you can go see Smokey Bear's grave at Smokey Bear Historical Park, which also includes a pretty cool museum about him and forest conservation. I put a link about it and some other things mentioned in this video in the description. Also, this story is really cute, but don't get it twisted. If this little shit brings trash in my yard again this summer, he's gonna get his ass beat. On to our last topic! In 1870, a man was traveling between Mora, New Mexico and Taos, New Mexico. He decided to stop for the night at the house of a local rancher near Palo Flachado Pass named Charles Kennedy. Kennedy ran a kind of inn out of his house as a side business and was well known to travelers in the area. The man settled in and sat at the table to have dinner with Charles and his family. Making conversation, the traveler asked if they had many issues with the Apache in the area. Charles' son replied with, Yeah, can't you smell the one in the basement? The traveler was taken aback by the statement and didn't notice Charles grabbing his gun. Charles shot the man right there at the dinner table. Charles then grabbed his son yelling, That is the last secret of mine you tell, boy! He then bashed his own son's head against the stone fireplace repeatedly till he was dead. During this, Charles's wife ran out of the house fearing she was next. She ran to the nearby town of Cimarron, New Mexico and into the bar of the St. James Hotel. She told the patrons of the bar what had happened. The men in attendance were rallied together by the gunfighter Clay Allison to go to the cabin and take care of Charles. They got on their horses and went to the Kennedy Ranch. They got there and confronted Charles. He attacked the men, but Clay Allison was able to shoot Charles dead. Clay Allison then cut off Charles' head to bring back to Cimarron. Clay put it on the bar of the St. James Hotel, saying he would shoot anyone that moved it. After a few free drinks, Clay was convinced to put the head on a stake outside. Except only about half of that is true. That is the version of the story I originally heard, and if you look around, you can find another dozen versions with different people going to town and different ways of killing Charles. At this point, the story has crossed into being folklore. This is a common occurrence with stories in history, especially ones that are dark and involve rural areas or people that weren't really influential because there is no one there to fact check it. These stories end up being kept alive from oral tradition and inevitably mutate over time. It can be extremely hard, if not impossible, to find the original story. Except we are in luck with this one. Thanks to an article from the Cuesta del Rios News that is linked below, I have found an article in the Santa Fe, New Mexican archive from October 13th, 1870, reporting on Charles Kennedy. The article reads, Charles Kennedy, well known to parties who have traveled the Mora and Taos roads to Elizabethtown and owner of the ranch at the junction of the above roads, was arrested last month and taken to Elizabethtown for examination on a charge of murder. The trial came off on the third instant when Jose Cortez testified as follow, that he was at Kennedy's house on Christmas of last year and that while he was there, he saw Kennedy shoot an American with a pistol and gave the following particulars. A stranger came to the house afoot and stopped for the night. He was an American and had large red whiskers. Witness and the stranger had gone to bed and witness was asleep when a pistol shot awakened him. There was no light in the room, but Kennedy soon after lit a candle and witness saw the stranger lying dead on the bed with a bullet hole through the head. Witness knew that Kennedy killed the man because there was no one in the house but Kennedy, his wife, the stranger, and himself. After refusing to help Kennedy bury the man, witness ran away to Taos but did not tell anyone there what had happened. The article goes on to talk about the trial and human bones being found underneath Charles's house. It goes on to tell us how Charles actually died. He was pulled out of his prison cell by a group of men and hung because they were worried that he wasn't going to get convicted. So going by this, which is probably the closest we'll ever get to a primary source, there are some things in the common folklore versions of the story that are probably not true. One, at no point do they mention a son, so that's probably not real. In most of the stories, a woman comes to town to tell the authorities to come get Charles, either his wife or another woman, but it seems like it was a man that had stayed there. Also, Clay Allison was probably not involved in this, and if he was, he probably would not have made it known. Not the best idea to brag about breaking someone out of jail and killing them. Also, from what I've read about Clay Allison, it seems really outside of his character to go behead someone. His nickname was the Gentleman Gunfighter, and he was known for playing pranks on people. It seems like a kind of a crazy prank even in the YouTube era to behead someone. This does make it pretty certain, though, that Charles Kennedy was a real person and actually killed people. With how he operated, there's also a decent chance that he had killed people elsewhere under a different name. This was a somewhat common occurrence throughout the world. There was the Bender family in Kansas who let travel stay in their house and then kill them and take their possessions. More famously, there's H.H. H. Holmes who would kill and rob people in his hotel in Chicago. H.H. H. Holmes is also believed to have committed crimes under different names in different places. And there are even more instances of similar things throughout history, like the Red Inn murders in France. I've also wondered before if Hansel and Gretel was inspired by something like this happening. You know, to kind of act as a warning about staying in strange houses away from other people. In the age before modern policing, if you killed someone and no one saw and no one found the body, I doubt you would ever be caught. Even today, only about 50% of murders are solved in the U.S. and around 70% in other developed countries, and that doesn't even count the murders that were never reported, like when they don't find the body. So the moral to this one is history can be tricky and you can always find more if you keep digging. That's all I have for you. Like and subscribe. Have a great day and eat something good.